afternoon from Los Angeles, from the Thayer Horn at the, at the hall at the Colburn uh, in, Institute, is it Institute school. or School? Colburn School, I made that mistake the other day. Colburn School of Music. Come on in to our latecomers. That was amazing Hollywood style applause <laughs> for our guest today, Dr. Don Green. Let's give it to him. <laughs> all around the world. You really are all around the world. We've got John watching in the Virgin Islands, which is a total first for us today. Um, surely you should be on a beach or something, but we're very happy you joined us. Um, London, uh, really uh, incredible audience. Um, we've got all our guys on the chat here as well, so ask them anything you want to know. Um, so welcome to you guys, welcome to you guys, and Dr. Don. Can I just call you Don? Sure. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's a total pleasure to meet you. We, we've seen you running around, you've done seminars uh, this week that have been, uh, you've, you've won the love and affection of all horn players here. And um, yeah, I do, I, everyone knows who you are and all the people watching you, you are the master of performance coaching and, uh, and just basically how to perform better. That's why we all come to you. Cool. At, but you started off not with musicians, but with sports people. Right. And what is it, my first question, if I'm allowed to ask the first question today, <laughs> what is it that makes a fantastic sportsman, when he's, he's at Wimbledon and he's got like one serve to go before winning the title, how does he get the ball in there? How does a, a golfer, when he's got that tiny little putt, how, what is it that they train that we can learn from? Well, they, they train how to focus, how to perform under pressure, how to perform better under pressure than when they're practicing. And to me, that, that's one of the differences. There are many similarities, but one of the differences between musicians and athletes is athletes have had sports psychology for 30 years to teach Olympic and professional athletes how to perform better because of the adrenaline. That's why in the Olympics they set not only Olympic records every four years, but world records at the Olympics. Those athletes are competing all the time. World Games, University Games, Pan Am Games, Nationals. But the world records drop only once every four years dramatically because of the adrenaline and the athletes learning how to use the adrenaline. Whereas in music for many years and continuing to today, the major advice offered by teachers is just relax which to me is totally wrong. Because if it's a high pressure situation, if it matters, if it's an audition that you want to win, you're going to feel pressure. You're going to feel adrenaline. And you're not going to be relaxed. My whole approach is on not even trying to relax. It's a waste of time and counterproductive. And you want to use that energy for more power, more presence, intensity of focus. Power takes a lot of energy to put air through the instrument and to stay focused through the whole concert or ring cycle. So athletes have long ago learned how to use adrenaline and musicians later on uh, learning how to use it for better performance. What made you make that, that switch? Because you were, you, you, you've coached Olympic athletes. Um, and what made you get interested into well, into I've, I've always Well, I've always loved music. I'm a very frustrated musician. I don't talk about it, but I've played guitar since I was 14. If I'd known that, I would have made you bring it, or I would have had one here. <laughs> <laughs> when I started at Juilliard, Julie Landsman gave me one, advice, one piece of advice, never bring a guitar to Juilliard. <laughs> so, so I, I to don't Juilliard. Do Juilliard. So I, I play now at about the level I was when I was 14 and a half. It's, it's my hobby, it's what I do. I don't really talk about it to musicians, but I've always loved music. Uh, but I grew up with sports. My mother was a diving mother. I wanted music lessons. I got trampoline lessons, diving lessons, platform diving lessons. I've always been fascinated by it. I love it. Uh, one of the most important pieces of music for me my freshman year at West Point was God Only Knows. And it helped me get through a very difficult time. And if you know that song, it starts with a horn. And I didn't know what instrument it was until later on. Why well, I love that sound. I, doesn't sound like a trumpet or a trombone, what is that? So I've loved it for a long time. So I was in Vail, Colorado, and in the winter I worked with skiers, and in the summer I worked with golfers. And I had just finished a golf clinic, <clears throat> and I got a call from a, evidently a musician, who says, when's your next golf clinic? And I said, it's not for a month. 
He says, uh, do you do individual appointments? And I said, yes. He says, how much do you charge? And I told him what I charge. He says, you charge that for an hour? Can I just see you for 10 minutes? <laughs> so, so I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a musician. I said, oh, what do you play? He said, I play bass. I said, tell you what, I'll trade sports or college. You, you give me some bass lessons. Oh. So, so I went out on the golf course with him, and he was a very good golfer. He was from the Syracuse Symphony. Uh, they were passing through Vale in a concert series, and he was, he was about a seven handicap, which is a really good golfer. <clears throat> and I went and watched him play. I tested him with some of my inventories, and he had problems with his putting. And the inventories, and what I was seeing was he stood over his putts forever, and then he jammed it. And I said, you're overthinking. He said, yeah, I know, I do the same thing with bass. Can you help me with that? I said, yeah, that's easy. So I gave him some of my methods and then went out and watched him play. And the next nine he shot, he dropped it by four strokes, which is huge, which is like eight over 18 holes. And he said, you know, everything you've taught me pertains to me playing classical music. Would you like to work with classical musicians? And I said, yes, I'd love to, it'd be really cool. So then he gave me the bass lesson. It took me about 30 seconds before my hands really hurt. <laughs> it sounded like terrible. So we stayed in touch and he, he went back to Syracuse. He was on the subcommittee and got them to write me a plane ticket to come out and work with the musicians there. And it was fascinating. And the first day I was there, I said, I, I'm a sports psychologist. I really don't know anything about music. You need to meet me halfway, I can give you sports examples. Fortunately, there were some other golfers in the orchestra. And the first day, I got mostly subs and backstand people. The second lecture, I got more than half of the orchestra. The third lecture, I got most of the principals in the whole orchestra. And it was one of the most exciting weeks of my life. I loved it. Uh, it was the first time I'd been around it and backstage and hanging out at rehearsals. I'd rather be there than with Olympic athletes. This is really cool. I'm backstage and... Did they react differently than your athletes to your, to your lectures? Yeah, to your... because it was... We had to come to an understanding about things. And athletes know this stuff. Yeah. And this was kind of new information, but they all sort of knew it. So as I was leaving, one of the horn players came up and he said, I've got an audition coming up for Houston Symphony. I'm in I'm Syracuse, but I hate Syracuse. It's cold here, and Houston's <laughs> <laughs> a better orchestra. Hopefully, not offend anybody. And uh, he said, "Will you work with me?" I said, "Yeah, but I'm going back to California, so we can do it on the phone." And at the same time, I got invited by an opera singer to work with her for a audition for the Chicago Lyric. And she both she and he had not done well at auditions. In fact, Brian Thomas. This is public knowledge, had failed the last 45 auditions in a row. And he told me that right before I left. <laughs> so we agreed to work on the phone with both of these people once a week, hour long sessions for the audition two months away. And uh, I just asked permission to tape them, tape our conversations. And I didn't know anything about classic music then. I just knew how to win, how to compete, how to train people to do well under pressure. So we, eight weeks later, she won the position with Chicago Lyric Opera, and he won Houston Symphony. So that's my first book audition success. I had it transcribed, and, and that's the book. So a little while later, Julie Lansman contacted me and said, I've got an audition coming up for the Met, one position. And uh, I think 250 people sent in tapes. And Julie, Julie asked me to work with four of her students for two months, again on the phone. I went to New York once and uh, worked with these people on the phone mostly. And then the audition came up and those people came in first, second, fourth, and fifth out of 59 people. The girl who came in first was Ann Shearer who won the job and she went to President Polisi and told them that it was helpful for me to work with her. And Barbara Jocelyn, who was a junior at Juilliard at the time, came in second. She played so well they offered her a $100,000 subcontract. And she went to Joseph Polisi, the president, told him about me, and they asked me to come to Juilliard, which I happily did. But I went there to learn, to really learn. So I went to a lot of Julie's classes, voice teachers, 
piano lessons, violin lessons, two years to really get the idea rather than just teach people like they were athletes and really get into it and amplify it. And I was also invited to, to teach at the New World Symphony, thanks to Sarah Bach and Denise Tryon, two more horn players. Horn has, horn has made my career. We, I love, we love horn. Hearing, we, <laughs> I love horn. We love hearing horn success stories. I mean, that's what we're all here for for this week. It's been so inspiring. I've, I've been fortunate to work with more horn players than any other instrument. Is it because? We suffer more than most other because you you work. <laughs> Good question, right? Is it because we suffer more? What is it? Um, can you say? Because that was going to be a question I was going to ask you. Um, out of all the instruments that you've worked with, do we all suffer from the same thing, or are there some that suffer more than others? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I was fortunate to learn from Julie Lansman, who taught me this, and we worked together, and I owe her a great deal of thanks to be here. Um, I soon became, I, I didn't know one instrument from the other, uh, but I soon came to realize what a pivotal instrument the horn is. I call it the quarterback. It's like the central part that everything revolves around, and the extremely challenging part of the instrument. That's what I love about it. Yeah. And, and that creates a lot of performance you anxiety. You just never know if what you blow in is what's <clears throat> going to come out. Oh, certainly. That's just yeah. our, our, our future, our, yeah, our fate, but our we life. love it. <laughs> Me too. But are we are we more susceptible as horn players? I mean, how do I think it, by all sorts yeah, I think of it comes out as an individual thing. Okay. Certainly, it's a lot different than a bass drum. <laughs> <laughs> bass drums have hard parts too. Sometimes, you know, that I'd be quite nervous to play that Verdi Requiem. Uh, so I was I was doing this uh, lecture at Manhattan School of Music, and I was outside and I saw this gong, big gong, and I went to the guy who brought me, and I said, you know. That's probably an instrument I could play. He says, no, you have to prime it. <laughs> get it right. I thought, okay, I can't even play the gong. <laughs> so so I, I think it's an individual personality thing. It's more the person than the instrument. Yes. So opera singers don't suffer more than... than uh, they opera singers they are suffer special. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. They I do. love opera. Yeah, I me too. Love opera. Me too. They suffer. <laughs> they, they really do. They, I mean, and I, I really admire opera singers because we have an instrument to hide behind. You know, we have an instrument. Oh, there was too much water in the tubes today, and uh, you know. But, but yeah, come on in. <laughs> but um, opera singers, they have to bear their souls more than anybody else out there. And I, I mean, I worked at the opera for ten years, and a lot of singers, they really do suffer. You wouldn't yes. believe it on the night, but well, they really it. do. You, you would. Yeah, <laughs> you would. So. Um, so where did they start, Don? We've had we've had uh, we've had uh, Dinka uh, Mijiklatkovic, uh, Radovan's wife, on the Horn Hangouts. She has her own uh, uh, series, which has helped me a lot. I've worked with her quite a lot. We've had Jeff Nelson with the with the Fearless, um, and and you're our third uh, psychologist on the Horn Hangouts. Um, and we like to get as much free information as we can. But Don has a has a website which you guys go onto. There's a performance inventory, performance, performance skills, skills inventory. inventory. Um, which you can take and, and sign up for classes and sign up for lessons. So I'm, I'm not going to ask Don for all his secret tips, but of course I'm going to ask them for ask him for some of them. Um, but the, when I read your stuff, and um, it all the, the thing that I think would help me the most with this this second voice, we've got the one voice that says pick up the horn, push the valve down, take it. We've got the other voice that's going. Oh my God! You know? Yeah. And that voice, we agree, really sucks. <laughs> that voice really sucks. So, I've read all the books and uh, somehow I've never quite managed to really calm it. Some days it's okay. And don't look at me like that, you guys. Just because we play in the Berlin Phil doesn't mean we, we haven't got our, our, our... Everyone's got their, their thing with nerves. That's right. just the way it is. It doesn't matter. And the higher you go, you know, the further there is to fall. So we have to deal with it just like anyone else. We just get better at hiding it. <laughs> um, and we go to help in private. <laughs> but um, for me, I was very interested in the centering, and I know, you know the, you, that's one thing you teach, so I don't want to ask you for, for all your tips, but is that something that you've had a lot of success with? That's the main strategy I use with Olympic athletes and professional athletes, golfers, tennis players, race car drivers, and every musician that I've ever worked with that mm -hmm. won an audition mm -hmm. knew how to center. Yeah. So the way it's centered, it's a, it comes from the martial art of Aikido, which is the most mental of all the martial arts. It was my mentor who went to Japan to study it and get a black belt. And he came back and got a PhD in sports psychology. And he combined them. <clears throat> He's the first one that, that understood the choking mechanism 
of why athletes choke, why musicians choke, and it's a specific mechanism that will set up the choking. Great athletes rarely choke. Though. Great athletes always choke. Yeah, but we don't see that. It's incredible. <laughs> That's because you see them later in their career after they've learned how to not choke. Okay. Yeah. But all of them have gone through choking. <laughs> There's not a person in the audience, including me, that hasn't choked. Yes, I mean, it's, it, totally. it's just a human mechanism based upon fight-flight response, which is hardwired from our caveman days. So that's fight a, your fear and win. Fight your fear yeah. and win. So the centering is designed to get people in the right performance mindset quickly. Uh, it's seven different steps. It's very involved. Uh, I've been teaching it this week, but you can't learn it in a week. That's why it's pointless to go through the seven steps right now. It's like a one-minute piano lesson. It just <laughs> doesn't work. Uh, it takes repetition. I've got three centering videos because it needs to be taught. Each is 15 minutes long over time. You watch the first one, you practice it for 21 times or a week, number two and number three, and then you have it. And at that point, you can center in less than 10 seconds. Namely, before you go on in between excerpts at an audition. When you first start learning, it takes about a minute and a half to go through the seven steps. But the step I have a story, may I interrupt you just Please. quickly? I'm allowed to tell this story. <laughs> uh, I asked Andrew Bain's permission. Andrew uh, plays first tour with us at the, at the Berlin Philly. He's been in for uh, quite a few times to play extra. And I played, I played with Andrew in Melbourne and, 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 and Berlin. And um, I've no I noticed in Melbourne, I, I just turned to him to say something just before the concert, and he was like, I thought, okay, maybe, maybe he's not feeling well or something. He was just doing that. Oh, okay, leave me alone. When he came to Berlin, he did it even more, because, I mean, that, that's, that was, you know, to go in as an extra as the first horn. It's quite a thing. So I would turn to him, you know, all happy, and just before the concert, second horn, want to give my first horn some support, and Andrew's like, <laughs> and I thought, what's he doing? So after the week was over, I said, Andrew, why do you just disappear on me? Just for a few seconds, just before the concert, he said, Don Green. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked Andrew if I could tell uh, that story, and he said happening. yes. Yeah, but um, he, was, he was doing his centering, but it's so quick. Yeah. And I thought, I've got to learn that. I've got to learn that. Yeah. And it is possible, it, it, takes, it takes, once you've learned it. Less than three breaths. Less than three breaths. Right, right before an exposed passage as you're going. Okay. So it's, it's designed to get you intent on what you want to do, what you intend to do, rather than going in wishy-washy and what am I going to do, be very clear about your, what you intend to do, especially on the start. And then to relax the muscles that tend to tighten up on, under pressure, because tight muscles cause mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. The worst enemy of a good golf swing is muscle tension. Worst enemy of good horn playing is muscle tension. Where do horn players get the most tension? Here. Right, right. Yeah, not here, here. Oh, no, this kind of area right yeah. here. Okay. So after you get relatively <laughs> relaxed, then the idea is to shift to right brain. When you're talking about the noise, it's not all over, it's just in the left brain. The noise machine, okay, the chatterbox, that's all left brain. And it goes into what's called a beta frequency very fast, rapid thinking, or thinking on multiple levels, or if you will, a whole committee meeting taking place in your head right before the solo. Committee <laughs> meeting? It's, a, it's a, a techno party in there. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, I tell you. That. Uh, and there's some critics in there, and some people that do analysis, and some that give technical advice, and it's, it's just noise. It's your own voice in there saying, keep it, keep it, pull it, put yourself together. What are you doing? Yeah, but it's people? also all teachers saying, you don't sound very good. You need to work more, and the whole group is in there. And the whole place of, of centering is right before you play, is to get you shifted from the noisy, analytical, critical left brain to your right brain, which is mentally quiet. Because mental quiet is an essential element of focus. And in our right brain, we hear sounds, feel embouchure, and see the music, if you will. The right brain does what we've practiced, right? The muscle memory, the... That's the, in right brain. The, the, that's all in the right brain. It's, so it's, like, it's like, like driving a car and stop, stopping automatically at the traffic lights. You don't think about it, you just that do You it. don't think about it, okay? You want to be mindful, but you don't want to be overthinking. And centering designed to get you over there, out of your head, into your center, because this is where you want to play from. Two inches below your navel, two inches into your body. That's your power source. That's especially the whole for the audience horn. is doing this. this <laughs> two inches. Come on, you guys online as well. Two inches below the navel. Two inches. That's the powerhouse. That's your center or dantian. It's a chakra point. 
Uh, that's where martial artists fight from. They don't fight from their head. You, you get kicked. <laughs> you gotta, you got to move from your center and trust all the practice, all the repetition, all the scales, all the arpeggios. So it's quote automatic. It's not automatic. It's muscle memory done mindfully, but without the words, without the instructions, without the analysis, without the criticism. Okay. After that, it's designed to help you use the energy in a productive way, not to push it down, but to use it as your horn comes up and then without hesitation you play. Because what I see with a lot of horn players is the horn comes up and then it's double clutching. Yeah. <laughs> and then the note does yeah. and the note doesn't speak. Okay? That's because a thought gets in the way or many thoughts get in the way. The whole idea is to from your center trust it, horn comes up and you let it fly. That's what centering does. And after you learn how to do it, you can do it in less than three breaths. And if you ever watch Greg Lugana's dive, at the back of the board, you can watch him centering. That's what he did before every dive. One of the greatest divers, one of the greatest athletes of all time, centered before every execution. And having watched him for four years, many, many times a week in practice, I can assure you, it wasn't just in me, he did it before practice size. He did not like getting hurt. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a long way down. Yeah. Yeah. We feel like that sometimes on the stage too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Don, I've got, I've got, can we just, can I just fire some sure. questions at you? Because you've got some great questions here from online. A lot of people watching. Um, Andre in London, uh, he said, he stands up to play a solo with piano. He turns to a quivering leaf. But if he has a solo, an orchestra, or a chamber ensemble, he can focus the adrenaline without shaking. There, there's some people have trauma things. This, this body quivering. Is that something that the centering can help us with as well? <clears throat> Helps some, okay? When people are under stress or extreme stress, they get different types of symptoms. Physical, mental, and emotional. Okay? Some are what's called task irrelevant and some are task dependent. It depends on what they are. So for the physical symptoms, they are shaking, pounding of the heart, changes in breathing, perspiration, needing to go to the bathroom a lot right before you go on. It just sucks. <laughs> it's, just, it's all normal. We're all hardwired like cavemen. So some of the, and dry mouth is another one. So some of these are very important to take care of, like muscle tension. Others, like if your knees are shaking, it's not connected to the horn, it's task irrelevant. And you just really don't want to pay attention to task irrelevant cues. There's a thing called purpose tremor. That if you put your hand out, all of us shake a little bit, okay? But if you pay attention to it, you'll shake more. <laughs> purpose tremor. So the whole idea is, yeah, shake a little bit. It's the horn hangout nerves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the whole idea is to pay attention to task relevant things like relaxing your upper body. Okay, so the more, good you, air, uh, the more you think about the, the think more about having to go to the bathroom, the more you have to go. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Je Jeff said that in his fearless thing as well. It was like you know the minute you, you realize your mouth is going dry, if you panic about it, it's going to go even drier. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff and I agree on just so many things, uh, but he's really a horn player and I'm not, and and we we agree on it, we just come at it from very different points of view and I think complimentary, which is kind yeah, of cool. Yeah, no, totally. Um, Sarah Kruger, great name, Sarah, uh, <laughs> has a question for Dr. Green. Uh, what is the first book or step to start the centering process from the very beginning? We have a little library. Yeah, here. Uh, like I said, the book Audition Success is it's not that good. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's before I really understood it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but performing success. <laughs> Fight Your Fear and Win, I work for a generic audience, uh, business people, athletes and executives, so it's a little bit watered down. So this is the book. This is the one? Yeah. Can I, oh, I have that one. It's <laughs> my last one. <laughs> uh, this is available on my website as an e-book. Yeah, that's right. It, yeah. I was just going to say, they're downloadable as well. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and what do you, do you, uh, do, you do, give, do Skype lessons or seminars? I or do Skype there? lessons, individual yeah. ones. I, I do them for the University of Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. I do a whole series of classes and I'm now setting up. Uh, there some my, people watching in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just formed my own Center for Performance Mastery. I just moved to LA to found this for athletes and musicians. And I'm going to offer my Juilliard class, my 14 week graduate class at Juilliard to every music school in the country and internationally through Skype that I, I can do it just like I did with Juilliard only through Skype and that's, that's 
next. Yeah. Uh, Dylan and were telling me about a special project. Is that, is that what you were talking yes. about? Yes. Okay, because they're going to be part of it. Very much so. Great, great. Well, who wants the better in all this, yes. uh, yes. all this performance stuff? Um, a question that we all, we've all sympathize, we will all sympathize with. Kevin McDonald asked, do you have any guidance on how best to recover after a flub during a performance? So that the rest of the performers goes well. We all know that, you know. It's, yeah. It starts and you think, oh, it's going really great to begin. The second <laughs> that it goes, you think that, then it goes wrong. So, uh, I'm an optimist. But mistakes are inevitable with this instrument. They're going to happen. It's not precluding them at all costs. It's having a recovery strategy so we can get back on track by the next note. So I've got a five-step recovery strategy. Okay. We want to know what they are, <laughs> what it is. Uh, you know, Tell us a couple of them so know, that we can... I forgot. Oh, you forgot? Okay, <laughs> right. Well, 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 we'll look those on. I should know that because I've been, I spent yesterday evening with you. Oh, cool. um, <laughs> so the first step is accept the mistake. You don't have to be happy about it. You can worry about that later or how to fix it. Immediately you need to accept it, okay? Mm. Second step is when classical musicians make mistakes, they tend to cringe or tighten up. It is embarrassing. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> So you cringe, and now you put yourself in a position to make another mistake. So what you want to do is immediately after you accept it, just drop the tension. Just drop it in like one breath. Then what you want to do is you want to focus on the process in the now. You want to get your mind back into the present because the note is in the past and it's gone. The beauty of music is it's moving, and you just need to get back on the, back on on the, the note. Yeah, back on a moving note, okay? The next one is if you need a process cue, what you need to do play, to play well, like good air, <laughs> good air, just simple, fundamental, nothing complicated, just to get back on track. And the last thing is you want to get back to solid playing before you try any heroics, okay? <laughs> you don't want to make up for the mistake by playing the rest of the piece the best you've ever played in your whole life. <laughs> You're just gonna take, make another mistake, which will set up a train wreck. So you want to work on this five-step recovery strategy, accept it, drop the muscle tension, get your mind in the present, focus on the process, just get back to solid playing. And you need to do this not only in concerts, but in rehearsals, in, in practices, yeah. <laughs> to get good at it, the whole goal is let it be an isolated single note mistake, the rest of the piece is fine. Back on by the next note, that's the goal and that's what you practice. Even in a practice room or in a lesson, if you make mistakes, you work on the recovery strategy. But you fix the mistakes later. Yes, absolutely. Right. I have a question. Um, the, this, this adrenaline surge, it's my worst, worst enemy. I right. mean, the split notes are not nice either, but uh, this, this adrenaline surge, I would like to be able to turn it into something positive, like, like, the, like the athletes. I will never right. earn as much money as the athletes <laughs> when they do that, but I would still like to be able to do it. I've, you know, we found, found strategies to sort of deal with it, but it still comes and bites you in the bum when you're, when you're not expecting it. Right. Um, and is, do people ever totally solve this, or is it just something we, should, we have to live with? Well, the adrenaline doesn't go away, but if you take it from causing mistakes, or not being a welcome thing, or shaking, yeah, to seeing that it's power, that you can really use it. So rather than trying to practice when you're always relaxed or hoping to be relaxed in a performance, I do simulation training. And some of you have done this this week. Rather than try to get relaxed before you play, I want the energy up. There's some great videos on your, on your, on your website jump. of people swinging great oh, big uh, weights between their legs and getting yep. into that. And that's, jumping that's, jacks that's and push-ups and all that. There's I want a trombone player running around on the beach. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then playing. And then playing. The yeah. whole idea is to get used to starting out feeling this high energy, okay? Rather than trying to figure it out on concert stage when you've been practicing relaxed all week, and now you shift from practicing relaxed, to, oh my God, on a concert <laughs> stage. So I want people to get up in a practice room. I want them to get their energy higher than it is at their most extreme stressful situation. And then pick up the instrument and go for it. So there really is something to the running up and down the stairs? Oh, absolutely. Because you, you figure it out then. And, and I have people tape record it, and I tell them the first seven times they play, don't listen to it because it's not going to sound good. Mm -hmm. But then you start getting used to it and, and not fearing the energy, but riding the wave of energy, and you start hearing a difference. And you practice it for a few days, and other people will start noticing a difference because you're not fighting the energy, you're riding the energy of the wave of energy that is power and intensity, and it can drive 
the air through the instrument and it becomes effortless power versus powerless effort that comes from the forcing and tightening and, and all of this. This is effortless power and this is what you want. And again, this is what Olympic athletes learn to use and musicians are coming around. <laughs> because it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a circle of fear, you know, if the adrenaline hits you, you get those shaky knees or you get, you know, you get the, the shake somewhere else in your heartbeat and then you, you, you may be okay, but the next time you play, you're a bit afraid that's going to happen again. Exactly. I mean, we all know this, everyone's nodding at you. And, and it, it goes like this, it's hard to be, I, I find it hard to make this adrenaline my friend, sometimes. Sometimes it, the adrenaline the other day on the stage, uh, the Hollywood Bowl was just, it was terrifying before we went on, but when we went on, that was just a moment I'll never forget. It was just, it was just, just huge. And, and I thought, gosh, one chance in my life to play here, I'm going to enjoy it. And that was a really great thing for me because before I thought I was about to go home. <laughs> I looked out of that little, little thing on the stage and saw all these amazing horn players playing the fanfare and Stefan said to me, don't look through there, that's not a good idea. <laughs> So, so how can we make that our friend? By, by getting used to it progressively in a safe situation, more adrenaline, more pressure, more jumping jacks, drink three cans of Jolt, two espressos. <laughs> What's Jolt? Uh, energy drink. Red Bull or something yeah, like that. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. okay. Ooh, uh. It's like there's some of these in Japan, you don't know what it is, you buy them from the local convenience store and drink them and you don't sleep for a week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I wouldn't offer people comfort. Uh, I generally say if you want to be comfortable, just stay at home and don't play the horn. <laughs> ah, very good so, point. Actually, maybe all of us in our subconscious, we don't actually want to be comfortable. So we come to all your lectures and try and learn, but actually we enjoy it. My, Fergus McWilliam, my, my teacher and mentor, um, is now my colleague, uh, there was one day I was complaining about really being nervous for a concert. He just looked at me and said, don't give me that, you need it. I was like, I don't need it, I don't like it, but maybe, maybe there is something about that, about horn players. Is that why we do it, do you think? Maybe. <laughs> So if you had a choice between comfort and winning the audition, which would you choose? I don't offer people comfort. If you want comfort, stay at home and take a lot of beta blockers, which I don't recommend. I'm a fan of energy and power and intensity, presence. And, and beta blockers cut this energy? They just slam it down. Okay. And I would no more ask a musician to take a beta blocker than I would ask an Olympic swimmer to drink a bottle of vodka before their race. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to me. People, other people say it's good for their playing and it calms them down, but... Uh, but it might, but I wonder if they could play better. Could they enjoy it then as much, maybe, mm -hmm. if they're not? That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like this idea of riding the adrenaline wave and using that because I've always wondered, as you said, why is it that at the Olympics they bring their best performances at the moment where it matters? And that, that is something we all want to do. Um, and, uh, and our mental state really gets in the way of doing that sometimes. Right. It really does. Right. But that's why we've got people like you. <laughs> <laughs> but, there, but there's a difference between mental state and fear. Mental state is thoughts. Fear is emotion. And they're in very different parts of our, of our brain. Uh, the thoughts come out of the cerebral cortex, the gray matter, left and right brain. But our emotions aren't there. Where are our, where are our emotions? Anyone? Yeah, the amygdala, the limbic system. What did okay? you say, sorry? The amygdala, A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A, -A -A, okay? Wow. It's the reptilian brain. You're it's on the, the next home <laughs> hangout. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> uh, this is the reptilian, this is our ancient brain that we share with reptiles and animals. And it's, it's hardwired in there. The fear response, the fight, flight, the deer in the headlights, that's hardwired in there. Okay, so it's normal. So there's nothing we can do to get rid of it, it's there. Uh, it's gonna be there. Yeah. It, it's what kept our ancestors alive. I mean, cavemen wouldn't have lived without the fight-flight response to run real fast or to stand there and hit the tiger in the face. Uh, <laughs> but it just is not really good right before an audition. Yeah. <laughs> you, where you would like to run for your life. Ah, let me out of here. <laughs> but you can't. So that, again, that's where centering comes in, is sitting in your chair for your exposed entrance Center. Sarah Kruger is asking great questions today, probably because she's got such a cool name. Um, <laughs> would Dr. Green suggest keeping the voices in the head completely quiet or change them to positivity, i.e. being positive about a mistake or simply keeping a quiet mind and not recognizing it? Awesome great question. question. Yeah. Great question. So the progression is from left brain negative to right brain positive to succinct right brain 
to shift then into right brain mental quiet. Okay. Can you say that again? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, was, I wasn't listening. No, no. <laughs> so, so from left brain, uh, critical, analytical, to more positive words, supportive, succinctly, to mental quiet and right brain just hearing the music and playing the music. Okay? That's how it works. There's a big difference between thinking in discernment and thinking in judgment. As musicians, you need to constantly be discerning. Is the note on pitch, tempo, is it correct? If it's not, you say, well, it's off pitch. That's implied to get back on pitch. But get back on pitch is a discernment. Very different than the judgment. The judgment sounds like, that sucks. Can't you do any better than that? <laughs> OK? No helpful information. No way back in, and you just take an emotional hit. So you, don't need, you shouldn't be brain dead when you're playing. But the criticism, analysis, instructions, dysfunctional, okay? You want supportive, but in short terms. But you want to drop the judgments, keep the discernment, but also try to play mentally quiet. Is that something we all have in common, all the people you work with? Yes. That we all are way too pew, pew. I call it the Juilliard syndrome, okay? Because <laughs> most of my students at Juilliard had negative self-talk, okay? That's how you get into Juilliard, not by being lax, but by holding yourself to higher standards. Set these incredible standards, just kick yourself all the way there, and as soon as you get there, set more unreasonable standards, okay? So I used to have people write out their self-talk. I would ask them to play something really challenging and then write it out. And these beautiful, a lot of them Asian girls are very sweet. Curse like a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. I don't even say things like that. I was in the army. It's just like, my God. I'll never be able to give a master class to Asian girls again. I wonder, <laughs> wonder what's going on in their head. I know what's going on. It's a, yeah. it's a negative syndrome. And I'd say probably at least 60 to 70 percent of the people in here have gotten in the habit of that because of the demands of the, of the instrument and, and what you do. It's not easy. You're expected to do great. And nobody likes to make mistakes. Yeah. My mom's watching. She's just tuned in from London. Say hello to mom. Hello, mom. Hi, Kim, can you get the room? Hello, mom. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? I like that. Sorry, I, I, was, I was listening. But when, I, when my mom joins in, I'm very happy about that. Um, so I think, uh, have we got any questions from, I know you, you, most of these guys have been at, been at your seminars this week, but if you have any questions, shoot, it's the last day of the IHS. Bring it on. <laughs> oh, everyone's very quiet today. They're all centering. Yes. <laughs> what do you do when it's not necessarily your own voice in your head, um, like, like causing you distress, like when it's like a colleague or a director or something? Interesting. I'll just repeat that for the so that picks it up on the mic. What do you do when it's not your own head, your own voice in your head? Oh, is, like a colleague criticizing yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> I've got nice a nice colleague. <laughs> magic, <laughs> magic word. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> How dare he or she, you know? You're sitting there playing that stuff. Oh, it's not my mom. Sorry, it's not my hangout. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Sam. That's the same thing, though. Know, what about if it's a director, though, that's giving you criticism, that's saying, you know, you can't be missing that entrance, or you can't be chipping that note right there, just giving you that hard time when it's already a high pressure situation. So you're saying, what is it? It's a conductor? When yeah. you can't just tell them to shut up. Right, and then I would, I would pay attention, I would clarify exactly what they wanted, what they're intending to do, what they want from you, be clear about it, and then I'd mentally rehearse it over and over and over, get it right in your head first. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of mental rehearsal. It's, it's an incredible advantage for you guys, because you just shouldn't be playing that much and putting the instrument on your face that much, and you can do so much good by mental rehearsal, just getting it really clear in your head, working out the kinks. You can do it with the music on the stand and literally go through it. I don't like the term visualization. I prefer mental rehearsal because the horn is not a visual thing. Figure skating, gymnastics, diving, that's visual. Yours is an economy of sound. You get paid for your sound. It's tied to good ambition and the feeling of it. But it's not a visual thing. You can play in the dark and people can hear it in the dark. So I don't like visualization like, like mental rehearsal. You can add visual to the mental rehearsal, but it's about sound and feeling, feeling of air, feeling of embouchure. 
And, and I would ask you to get very clear in your head before you play anything. Get it right in your head, otherwise you're just gonna prove with the instrument on your face that you don't have it right in your head. <laughs> so it can save a lot of time just by going through it, mentally rehearsing everything. Get it right in your head. I've heard stories of concert pianists on trips to Europe from here who had never seen the music before. Is that true? That, that is true. Style, that is, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's proven true. That learned it by mentally rehearsing it, got there, went to the concert, played it for the first time, flawless. Wow. You can do amazing things. If you ever watched Luganus dive, he was a master of mental rehearsal. He started mentally rehearsing when he was three years old, when he was taking dance lessons, and a music teacher would have him lay on the ground, put on the music, and have him have them mentally rehearse it. He was amazed when he was like 17, he was diving internationally, talking to other divers, that nobody else was doing it. He could not believe that people weren't taking advantage of this. Um, he was trying a new dive at One Nationals. To, to get a new dive on the record books, you have to do it in front of judges at a national competition. And the dive was a reverse two and a half pike on the low board. When I was diving, you couldn't even do it on the high board. <laughs> And he was doing it on the low board, okay? And so he was getting ready to do it. I had been with the team every day in practice for the last month before, and I could swear I, he never did this dive. He went to the Nationals, judges are there, he did it the first time, not only did he make it, he nailed it. I mean, he could have got nines and tens on it. And everybody's saying, oh, you've been practicing this for months. And now he says, I practiced this a thousand times in my head. This was 1,001. Came as no surprise to him that he nailed it. And I think a lot of you guys don't take full advantage of this, especially the last week before an audition. Where you shouldn't be playing Where you much. shouldn't be playing. It's like cramming before yeah. the SAT. What you should be doing is backing off, getting more rest, going through it in your head, going there fresh and rested with everything clear in your head. That, to me, is the way to go into an audition. Absolutely. The day before my brother and Phil audition, I almost didn't touch the horn, but exactly. I, I, I could see myself going into the hall. I knew even what I was wearing beforehand. I'd planned it all and went in there and, and had, a, had a good day, thank goodness. But the, the, the imaging really, really helped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Barbara is watching, just like Carrie. She says, hi, Don, and say I can't be there in person. I wanted to say that Don helped me so much before my first Met audition. We know. He already <laughs> told us. <laughs> um, and one thing Don helped me with was to watch my negative self-talking regard to the audition. Positive thoughts. So is this a great The, the name of the book is called the, yeah. You Can't Afford the Luxury of a Negative Thought. Yeah. You guys can't. You have a negative thought, it's going to cause a mistake. Cause a mistake, you'll have another negative thought. It just kind of spirals. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. Um, yeah, question. Uh, do you take a different approach um, to people who have attention disorders? Yeah, that this question came up too now. The attention disorder, but the A, what's it called? The A, A, D, A, D, D, A, D, A, D. Someone asked that already earlier on. Um, yeah. The, the whole point of centering is to focus, okay? And I believe the vast majority of us have ADHD, okay? <laughs> Including me. What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the attention span for children is two to four seconds. The attention <clears throat> span for adults is four to six seconds. The attention span for horn players? <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it, it's a normal thing that our attention wanders, okay? It, it's a normal thing. But the idea is, is, especially when you're playing horn, is to constantly bring it back on task to the bouncing note. And you just practice it and you work on it and work on it and work on it. Everybody needs to learn how to focus better. Yeah. It, it just blows my mind that we don't teach kids how to focus, we just prescribe medication for them. It, it just fries me. Uh, yeah. I, I did a program <laughs> recently about the, the brain, the music in the brain, and the brain. It was just a little 12 minute thing um, from my program, but I was amazed at what the, this brain specialist in Germany um, uh, told me about the effect of music on kids' brains. Incredible. I don't understand, actually, having done the research and meeting this guy, why is music not taught in every single school throughout the world? Because it's been proved that kids up to the age of eight. Um, build most of their skills that turns them into whatever they turn, turn into, and music is a huge help yes. to that. It's yes. medically proved, isn't it? Uh, improved scientifically to increase cognitive functioning, uh, a analytical skills, reasoning. It, it's amazing that we don't have it in our schools and we teach people to memorize nonsensical facts. Yeah. <laughs> or make them sit down and listen to music, which is also nice, but they should be getting out there and playing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, really. So I, I think it was Simon Rattle. Somebody said, 
think it was Simon that said that uh, if you if you want your kid to enjoy sports, you give them a football and they they kick it around. Or if you want them to uh, enjoy painting, they you get a piece of paper and give them some paint and they do that. But if you want them to enjoy music in the schools, they sit down and listen to that piece. You know, <laughs> and that was the old, that's the old school of teaching, maybe. But they need to get out there and and, and play with stuff, make melodies, create pieces. Yeah, it's good for it. It's healthy, right? There was one more question going on. Yeah. The afterwards adrenaline after you play that bass solo. Oh. So have you ever experienced people getting too much or too focused where afterwards everything is just a complete blur? That's, that's happened to me sometimes where after I'm done playing, I don't even know what's going on around me. That that's a very good point. Yeah. I, I've had that as well. Where you, you've got through the solo, you've done your thing, and then all of a sudden it hits you and you shake through the the next ten minutes. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah. The thing You're is on a roll today. <laughs> <laughs> You have all the time leading up to an important performance, concert, or audition, okay? And you're thinking about it and you're burning energy. Uh, you might lose some sleep over it, you might practice more, you might take an extra lesson, which is not recommended right before <laughs> an important event. And you're building all of this up. And then you're in there and you're focused. And it takes enormous amount of energy to focus, okay? To really get totally focused for a long period of time just burns massive amounts of energy. So you keep it, you keep it, you keep it, and, and you're in the zone and totally focused, and then it stops. And for a while, you're still in the zone, and then the energy depletion hits you and you drop. It just, to the floor, okay? All of you experience this after a big concert. You're just exhausted, okay? And because energy is required to pay attention, the energy's gone, and you're in kind of la-la land. <laughs> and there's no more pressure, so there's no need to do it. And it, and it just kind of falls apart. And that's why I recommend to people, after an important performance, after an important audition, take the next day or days off. Don't play, recover. Recover from it, okay? Uh, what am I going to do the next two days? I'm going to recover. Me <laughs> so too. I, I tell you, I am. Uh, that's it. Uh, no, we've, if, uh, if you we've see me later, and I'm kind of nodding <laughs> off. <it's, laughs> yeah, everyone tonight uh, in the concert. Yeah, it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> but who's had a good time this week at the IHS? <laughs> So incredible, and and for Tim, handsome Tim at the back there, Tim, we, we need actually. I would like you to come down here and join us for the last few minutes. Can you put up a shot for everybody, um, so that you come down and join us? Because this is the man that's brought brought the horn hangouts to the world, and I think he needs a Hollywood moment of applause as well before we we, we thank you for for being here. We we we're doing really well. Um, if anyone, while Tim's coming down, any other last questions for Don in the room? Yes. Yeah, a um, lot of positive reinforcement, always with kids. If you can make it fun as much as you can. There's a marvelous book called Mastery by George Leonard, which talks about the difficulty of learning and, and why it's so hard for people to do. And most people don't understand learning plateaus and all the great ideas in can this book. Can you repeat book. the name again? Yeah, it's, so it's Mastery can... by George Leonard. The subtitle is The Keys to Long-Term Success and Fulfillment. He uses the analogy of tennis to get across why people get stuck at intermediate levels of tennis or skiing or music and how to break through that stuck period. And this is something I definitely give to younger kids in addition to make sure they have a good teacher, the right equipment, uh, the right structure for practice, the importance of practice, take them to concerts, take them to recitals, help them to love music uh, so they can enjoy it the rest of their lives. Does that get it? Don, you are so inspiring. Um, I think you're going to have a lot of hits to your website. <laughs> um, and not only from everyone here, but from the, from the, the, the online audience that are going. Oh. Right ah, there's just a quick question before we start celebrating this man. Um, <laughs> Heidi from New York asks, any pointers for older players? Because people who've been doing it a long time um, and who've been fighting the demons often for a long time, that's, that's harder. That, that's harder to, to banish from your, from your thinking. Well, I think if they're playing later, it's great because it's, it's wonderful to have this gift and be able to use it the rest of your life. Uh, that's not to say she can't improve her mental game like anybody else. There's no excuse there. But to really enjoy it 
and, and to enjoy playing more with other people as a social function and to realizing that music uh, decreases the effects of dementia or, or it stops or it precludes it. It has marvelous effects on the brain throughout aging. So keep on playing. Keep on playing, keep on playing. May I, may I divert sure, just for a sure. moment before? Sorry. Um, <laughs> Dr. Tim Kelly, it was really important for me to bring Tim down. I hope that you're in the shots. If not, we're all gonna, we're all gonna move over and get you, get you in the shot because now there's nobody behind the camera. Um, I would just like to say on behalf of, uh, well, Horn Hangouts from me, our online audience, and from everybody at this IHS, what an amazing job you've done this week. And the whole Horn world just adores you. Is this not true? Tim Kelly, a word. You're all too kind. Um, <laughs> it's been lots of fun. I don't play the horn at all. Never have, but I think maybe I should start because it sounds quite <laughs> He nice. knows more about it than anyone else. <laughs> I've had some really good first teachers. I've seen a lot of really good hangouts, so I think I've got it down. But I've had a really fun week. It's been really fun filming stuff and streaming stuff and meeting some really great people. So Highlights? Thanks for having me. Highlights. I like, there was this concert at the Bowl, the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> but I thought, yeah, I thought that was okay. I'll tell you later. I, I, I thought that was okay. <laughs> yeah, just the whole week. The whole week's sort of... I can't believe it's been just one week because I can barely remember what happened two days ago, let alone back on Sunday and Monday when it all started off. So it's been really fun. Yeah, and Jeff has just written on the only thing that would have made these horn hangouts more fun this week is more horn hangouts. Thanks, Tim and Sarah. This week was great for those of us who couldn't be there. So those of you who couldn't be there, make sure you come to an IHS event. We have a fantastic time here. We do crazy things. There's a video coming up about the crazy flash mob we did the other day, how I almost got arrested. Uh, you laugh. I had to give my details to the police. Yeah. You'll be seeing it all on the video. Uh, Officer, handcuff me. Uh, you really have so, um, yeah, Tim's off back to Australia tomorrow, I'm off back to Berlin, and Don, what are your plans? Back to Pasadena and go to sleep. You go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful way to finish off. I've been with Don, I would mailed Don months ago, ages ago, to try and set up a hangout, and we were planning on doing it actually via webcam, mm. weren't we? Because we were dying to get him on the Horn Hangouts, but this was a much, much, much better way of getting it done. I'm so happy to be It's an honour and a privilege, and for what you've done for our music world. Thank you very much, Don. Thank My you for pleasure. coming on the Horn, Horn sure. Hangouts. Everybody, get the books, get on the website, do the performance skills inventory, and uh, Don, you're a hero. Hollywood, applause for Don. <laughs>